Coming up next on SoCal Connected. Football is coming back to Los Angeles. Will a new NFL stadium be a big score for downtown LA? This is exciting for me and the whole city. Or will we just end up with more traffic, more debt, and empty promises? Plus, wild horses. Roundups are under fire for being inhumane. Some of the areas are so devastated, you absolutely have to remove them. What will happen to these symbols of the Western frontier? Why are we waging war against the horse we rode in on? That's next on SoCal Connected. SoCal Connected is made possible through the generous support of the Amundsen Foundation, serving the Los Angeles community since 1952. Jim and Ann Rothenberg, the Maddox Brown Foundation, the Elizabeth Hofert Daily Trust, the John Randolph Haynes and Dora Haynes Foundation, by U.S. Bank and by UCLA. The different forms of new media that are coming about, Wikipedia, your YouTube, are transforming the way in which students and professors not only interact with each other, but interact with the outside world. We really haven't seen a transformation like this in about 500 years, and the last time was when the printing press was invented. The model of the university as an ivory tower is really an old model. The university has become much more porous, and I think the model of the university as a network is really the way to think about uh, how knowledge in the 21st century will function. Since 1863, the dreams of millions have taken off with us, U.S. Bank. As our country has grown stronger, so have we. Today, we are one of America's strongest banks, focused on the future and eager to lend. So every dream, big or small, can keep growing stronger. Imagine what you can do when you have all of us serving you, U.S. Bank. SoCal Connected starts now. Good evening, I'm Val Zavala. It's been almost two decades since we've had a professional football team in Los Angeles. Now there are plans to build a billion dollar stadium downtown, and they claim it won't cost taxpayers a dime. The plan has quickly turned into a political football. This week, as public meetings get underway, LA Times columnist and SoCal Connected contributor Steve Lopez looks at the numbers game. They were all there, gushing over the possibilities of football's return to our fair city. Rams legend Rosie Greer, Lakers heroes Magic Johnson and Jerry West, boxing golden boy Oscar De La Hoya, and the littlest guy in the room. With this announcement, I think it's very clear. Football is coming back to Los Angeles. They came at the behest of AEG, and Shoots Entertainment Group to announce that a heavyweight insurance company was ready to plunk down a cool 700 million for naming rights to a downtown stadium. We're proud to announce today the most significant step forward in the last 15 years in our efforts as a community, as leaders, to return the NFL to Los Angeles. Ladies and gentlemen, Farmers Field. Farmer's Field is the brainchild of self-anointed downtown savior Tim Lewicki. He's AEG's Los Angeles point man and the guy who brought you the Staples Center and LA Live. And the reason that we believe that we could take a billion dollar investment and bring the NFL back to LA is because we had faith. Farmer's Field estimated to cost at least $1.5 billion would be shoehorned in between Staples and the 110. The stadium slash event center would feature a retractable roof and have seating for up to 70,000 rabid football fans. Okay, LA, what do you call it when you've got a name for a stadium, but no stadium? You don't have a professional football team, but you do have a mayor who wants to be head cheerleader. That, my friends, is a touchdown. Now, the details of how this thing is going to get built are still being worked out, but in broad strokes, AEG hopes to lease the land from the city for a buck a year, and the city would float a $350 million bond. AEG promises to pay back that money. They promise through revenues generated by the stadium. And, and I want to repeat that. 
because some people don't seem to get this, so let me repeat it. This is about the community, that it will be paid for completely, privately, we promise. We've tried to be very consistent. Councilwoman Jan Perry, who represents the downtown area, seems to like what she's hearing. Any time we have a project that will bring this many jobs, this much new revenue, I think it merits our close examination. And I feel enthusiastic about it, even though we're about to go through a very complex vetting and examination process. I think when we come out on the other end, we'll have a project. A project that calls for tearing down and rebuilding the West Hall of the existing convention center, which we're still paying for, by the way, at the rate of about 48 million bucks a year. Keep in mind, football is a part of the overall concept. What we hope to do is to move ourselves, as the city of Los Angeles, from 15th position in exhibition and convention space to 5th position. I think the figure that we are seeking to get to is 1.5 million square feet of exhibition and convention center space. And they say it's going to bring new hotels, bigger conventions, and lots of jobs. More construction jobs, ultimately permanent jobs. We have a local hire ordinance, so obviously we'll be able to hire people from within a radius of the project. So it's, in a way, our own economic stimulus package right here in Los Angeles. Who could possibly argue with that? Those sorts of economic stimulus claims surrounding a stadium are usually overstated and very often that economic stimulus effect doesn't exist at all. Clearly, Councilman Paul Krikorian isn't quite ready to pony up for season tickets. It's been 15 years since we've had an NFL team and it would be great to have an NFL team back in Los Angeles. My concern is that uh, we don't want our excitement about the idea of an NFL team returning to cause us to make judgments in a hasty fashion. Do most Angelinos want a pro team so badly they're willing to pay for it with even more congestion in and around one of the busiest intersections in the nation? Well, I think uh, people have a tendency to want to take the freeways if they can. I think what happens on game day at USC is instructive. Uh, there's congestion on the surface streets, there's congestion on the 10 and the 110 as people try to get to the location. So a major event like this, an event generator like a, a stadium or a coliseum is going to affect the entire network. But you don't necessarily need a stretch limo to get to your luxury skybox. LA has a very substantial public transit system. I mean, we move an enormous number of people by bus. We're really very large and very productive in that respect. I know we're uh, viewed as the, the center of America's car culture, and cars are important to a lot of people, and they're a big part of each household's mobility and quality of life, but we also move many, many people by transit. Traffic and transit are two of the many details that would be covered by an environmental impact report. Another focus would be the effect on air quality. Oh, it's a huge consideration, especially in a project like this where they might be generating tens of thousands of uh, vehicle trips, all these cars and buses and uh, trucks uh, emitting diesel, which is uh, uh, highly uh, harmful to human be beings. In Los Angeles, developers choose and pay the consultants who do an environmental impact report. But in the case of Farmers Field, AEG is lobbying to be protected from so-called frivolous lawsuits that could delay construction. If you can't hold them responsible for it in court, then what do they care if it's accurate or complete or not? Uh, and even if it is inaccurate and incomplete, uh, if the city council accepts it and uh, says they're going to approve the project anyway, and uh, you can't challenge that approval in court, well, you know, you, 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 you pretty much described what, what could be a, a real big uh, worry for everybody here. Two years ago, the City of Industry was granted such a waiver in its quest for an NFL stadium. At the time, a state assemblyman named Krikorian voted no. Now a councilman, Krikorian has introduced a motion opposing a waiver for farmers. If a project like this is going to go forward, whatever risk there is has to be borne by the developer and has to completely exempt 
the city of Los Angeles and its taxpayers from any uh, cost that could be incurred by that risk. As a taxpayer in the city, I wonder if I could ask you to guarantee me that the Raiders are not the team I that we get in Los Angeles. I think you won't have to worry about that. Yeah. I think you're okay. Are we Los Angeles? Don't start your end zone celebrations just yet. I'm Steve Lopez for SoCal Connected. You can read Steve's column every Wednesday and Sunday in the LA Times. And get the full score on AEG's stadium proposal on our website at kcet.org slash SoCalConnected. Which country built the most expensive sports stadium in the world? The USA, England, or Germany? The USA holds the current record of $1.6 billion spent for the Meadowlands Stadium in New Jersey. Previously, London's Wembley Stadium opened in 2006 and cost $1.5 billion. In tonight's commentary, Brian Unger says he's hoping a new stadium won't make an end run around downtown L.A. Los Angeles, it's not that you don't live in a real city because you don't have an NFL stadium. It's that you're not a real city unless you have a fight over how much it's going to cost taxpayers to build it. Take Farmer's Field, the proposed 68,000 seat stadium for downtown LA. Ah, Farmer's Field. It sounds almost quaint until you see the price Farmer's Insurance will pay to name the stadium after themselves. Seven hundred million dollars. You got to turn down a lot of insurance claims to afford naming rights like that. But let's forget for a moment that Farmers Insurance could spend $700 million to pay for other things, like helping to ensure that homeless people have a home to insure at all, or on helicopter rides for every football fan so they can avoid the eight clogged freeways they'll have to take in order to actually witness a football game in Farmers Field, or a basketball game at Staples Center, or a concert at Nokia Theater, or a walk through my favorite downtown attraction, the L.L. Bean Homeless Sidewalk Campground. Okay, there's no L.L. Bean homeless sidewalk campground. But why not? Isn't that the real question here? I lived in downtown less than a mile from where Farmer Stadium will stand. And I moved after a hot dog vendor was nearly stabbed to death outside my front door. It took the city four days to clean the blood off the sidewalk because that's how long it takes to clean any sidewalk in a city that's broke and broken. So how about a Farmer's Insurance free clinic on 6th and Main? a Campbell's Soup Kitchen on the other Wall Street, or a few Ronald McDonald houses on San Pedro for people who aren't sick yet. Because if corporations can pay $700 million to name the good real estate, as part of the deal, let's require them to help fix the bad real estate too. Not just the part where Jack Nicholson goes for fun at night, or to where Charlie Sheen sends someone to buy the stuff he needs so he can have fun at night. Sounds like a fair game to me. Invest the capital in all of downtown. Then, after we build the new farmer's field, who knows? We might even attract an NFL franchise to play there. I'm Brian Unger. The national debate over money and where to spend it has even spread into wild horse country. Government roundups are under fire for being inhumane. Now Congress is considering cutting funds for the wild horse program. Are we loving these horses to death? Correspondent John Larson reports. It's cold and shortly after sunup. For 90 wild horses, today is moving day. This is a federal government facility in Ridgecrest, California, where hundreds of wild horses and burros removed from the open range are held for eventual relocation and adoption. However, increasingly, these are animals that few people want. The growing question of what to do with wild horses in captivity involves the highest levels of the federal government. A management program so overwhelmed the U.S. Interior Secretary has sounded the alarm. And an increasingly critical public who argue the animals are needlessly being driven off the open range. You want to be gentle, huh? You want to be gentle, huh? 
Art de Grazia works for the Federal Bureau of Land Management, supervising wild horse and burrow operations out of the BLM's Ridgecrest facility. We have to create the ecological balance on the range. And basically, all that means is, is to make sure that there's enough grass out there for all the animals to eat. Wild mustangs range over 34 million acres of public land in 10 western states. But they must share that land with millions of domestic cattle. In what they say is an effort to balance interests, the Bureau of Land Management wants to limit the number of wild horses and burros to less than 30,000. Why are we waging war against our great partner in building this country? Why are we waging war against the horse we rode in on? Deanne Stillman is the author of Mustang, the Saga of the Wild Horse. She argues that the government wants to clear thousands of horses from the open range so that big business can move in. Various lobbies wield a lot of clout within the Bureau of Land Management. Powerful lobbies that, that have a great impact on wild horse management are the cattle industry, oil and gas and mineral extraction lobbies, and the hunting lobbies. The BLM says the land can sustain only so many horses. Some of the areas are so devastated, you absolutely have to remove them because uh, there's nothing to eat or drink out there. Since 2001, the BLM has captured and removed over 74,000 wild horses and burros, often using helicopters to do it. These roundups have aroused the anger of citizens who believe the animals should stay in the wild. We're saying, hold it, hold it. Oh, good girls. Jill Starr runs the Lifesavers Wild Horse Rescue in Lancaster. You're taking too many horses. You're taking them saying that there's not enough forage, that they're unhealthy. Yet, look at the horses that are being removed. They're healthy. They're shiny. They're strong. What are you doing? The government trucks the captured horses and burros to short-term holding facilities, like the one here in Ridgecrest which on this day holds 900 horses and 500 burros. Here, the animals are sorted and readied for adoption. We come in each corral every day, getting them used to these everyday experiences that they're going to experience when they get adopted. There is nothing quite like walking into a herd of wild horses. And they're just starting to become domestic horses here, uh, and learning what the people touch them. We don't hurt them. They are cautious, but curious. Don't take my key out of that cart. <laughs> Talk on it. So anything loose or interesting, they'll grab it. Oh yeah, they're inquisitive, and they'll get to playing with it. You know, like a bunch of kids. Yeah, horsey, 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 horsey. This public adoption in Redlands was one of dozens the government will host this year. So how long would it be to be able to ride them? Would you have to wait a long time? Or you'd probably for just over $100, anyone with a place to safely keep a horse or burrow can adopt one. Um, and, the and they're gentle? And the burrows here are not gentle. You would need to go through the gentling process, process with the burrows, just like with the horses. You know, I cuddled with him. He likes to have me hold his head like this. Some, like Sandy Anderson, have adopted several wild Mustangs. You have a relationship with them like you do with your family. I mean, they become part of your family. It's not like um, they're just a horse. Wild horses have even been adopted by the Marine Corps, which uses them in its mounted color guard at numerous public events. If the Marines are going to have a horse, it seems only right that they're going to have a wild American Mustang. Exactly. One of the great things that they always say at our parades are America's heroes are riding America's living legends. And, uh, you know, it really fits. So, I mean, we've got our American muscle right here. However, over the years, the government's adoption efforts have failed to find enough homes for the animals. And now, the recession has made the situation critical. Where once the government might adopt out a hundred animals in a weekend, now it might find homes for only a handful. Hay is not cheap. Veterinary care is not cheap. Tack is not cheap. All these things play into that. And in today's economy, it's a little tough. The horses that aren't adopted are packed up and trucked hundreds of miles. Their destination? Pastures in Kansas and Oklahoma, where they live out the rest of their days courtesy of Uncle Sam. 
In 2001, there were fewer than 10,000 horses and burros in government captivity. Now, that number tops 32,000 and continues to grow. I just don't see any solution. If they continue to take horses off the range and stick them in corrals, then what? The skyrocketing cost of feeding and boarding the animals is endangering the government's ability to manage the herd. The BLM spent nearly $39 million on the program, a figure that is expected to more than double in just two years. In an open letter published in the Los Angeles Times, U.S. Interior Secretary Ken Salazar admitted the current situation is unsustainable. The growing population of captive horses, critics say, has led the BLM to lower its adoption standards. They adopt horses out to people that shouldn't even have a turtle, let alone a wild horse. In the spring of 2009, agents raided the Three Strikes Ranch in Alliance, Nebraska, where they found 200 starving Mustangs and the carcasses of 75 more. The wild horses had been sold to the ranch by the BLM. Jill brought some of the survivors, their bones clearly visible, to her ranch in Lancaster. The wild horse and burrow management program is a fiasco. It, it, the way it's going, it will never have a solution. It's just, they're just still adding to the problem. And it's, the problem is getting bigger. Jill, who's taking care of 300 wild horses already, says there's not much more she can do. This is the largest number of horses we've had at any one time under our care. Almost every day somebody calls or emails and they have a, a Mustang that they can't care for anymore or one that's at the auction and in danger of going to slaughter and, and can I take it? And I, I, I absolutely have to say no at this point. To, it breaks my heart. It breaks my heart. Two million wild horses once ran the American West. They were descendants of the original horses brought by the Spanish. They ran free before they were captured, before their range was settled and fenced, before they were butchered for meat by the tens of thousands. It was horses pulling wagons and plows that helped build the nation and define its soul. But almost everyone involved in their future agrees something has to change, and it has to happen soon. I'm John Larson for SoCal Connected. The Bureau of Land Management has announced reforms in the way it handles wild horses. First, fewer horses will be removed from the open range. Second, it will set up birth control for mares. And third, it will try to coax more people into adopting wild horses and burros. Which of the following are the only true wild horses in the world? Mustangs, Brumbies, or Chevalsky's horses. horses. Chevalsky's horses are the only true wild horses because they have never been domesticated. All the others are actually feral horses, domesticated breeds that now roam free. We got tremendous response from last week's investigation, Show Me the Money, a story about a little-known program that allows some LA police and firefighters to collect their pensions and salaries at the same time. Here's what some of you wrote or tweeted. Tough Love writes, the program should be dropped, no pun intended, because it's just another taxpayer ripoff. Michael writes, you're talking about people who in a split second can be killed protecting the general public. That's our program for tonight. Remember, you can find us 24-7 on the web at kcet.org slash SoCalConnected. I'm Val Zavala. For everyone at SoCal Connected, thanks for watching. Good night. Coming up next week on SoCal Connected. They took my mom and I started crying. One family, two countries. I didn't even get to hug my mom or give her a kiss or say goodbye. What happens when parents are deported but their children stay behind? The hardest thing for me was when they put her in handcuffs. It's like, like, how can you do that to my mom? A family divided. Next week on SoCal Connected. Tomate esta botella conmigo. En el último trago.
nos va Quiero ver a qué sabe tu olvido Sin poner en mis ojos tus manos Esta noche no voy a rogarte Esta noche te vas de de veras Qué difícil tratar de olvidarte sin que sienta que ya... SoCal Connected is made possible through the generous support of the Amundsen Foundation, serving the Los Angeles community since 1952, Jim and Ann Rothenberg, the Maddox Brown Foundation, the Elizabeth Hofert Daly Trust, the John Randolph Haynes and Dora Haynes Foundation, by U.S. Bank, and by UCLA. I'm Gene Block, and I'm the Chancellor at UCLA. UCLA has an enormous impact on this community. and We now have a commitment to help reopen Martin Luther King Hospital. Recently, we've partnered with LAUSD to create a community school putting knowledge to work. One of the great challenges in Los Angeles now are quality jobs, high technology jobs. We can play such a key role, actually, in creating new opportunities for our youth. So I think we're going to see that UCLA is going to have a much greater presence in Los Angeles in the future. At least that's my dream. Since 1863, the dreams of millions have taken off with us, U.S. Bank. As our country has grown stronger, so have we. Today, we are one of America's strongest banks, focused on the future and eager to lend. So every dream, big or small, can keep growing stronger. Imagine what you can do when you have all of us serving you. U.S. Bank.